Bueno, so let's start. So welcome everybody to a new edition of the ICC UB Colloquia. So this is Colloquia from the Institute of Cosmic Sciences, which belongs to the university and is mainly in the six and seven floors of the Faculty of Physics. Today's Colloquia, so as just to give a brief introduction, we are trying, or the Colloquia Commission is trying to have like on the order of seven or eight Colloquia per year of highly renewed speakers. And today's speaker is actually from the, the, from the Department of Physics, so it's Professor Jose Ignacio La Torre, who is, just to give you a brief rendition of, or a brief summary of what he, he is currently, so of his CV. So he's Professor of Theoretical Physics at the Department of Quantum Physics and Astrophysics. He's also the Director of the Centro de Ciencias de Benasque, which is a place where many meetings scientific meetings are being organized in Spain. It's a beautiful place, actually, and which has been rolling already for many years. He's also recently the group leader of the quantum group at the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. This Barcelona Supercomputer Center, for those who, do, who don't know, is on the other side of the diagonal, and is uh, one of the largest infrastructures of Spain, of supercomputation, and there they, have, they are starting currently a group to build a quantum computer, or a quantum annealer in this case. And he has also um, engaged in many other adventures, so to say. One of them is also being part of Entanglement Partners, a company that tries to join uh, industry to this kind of research. Just to give you uh, or to say some things, he has performed research studies at the MIT, at CERN, at Niels Bohr's Institute, Niels Bohr, and also recently, and he's currently affiliated for what I see there, he has been in the Center for Quantum Technologies in Singapore, spending a long period of time there. His main recent research, for what I have seen actually on, on his recent publications, deals mainly on entanglement in many body quantum systems and properties of entanglement and quantum properties in general, and also on the study of parton distribution functions at the Large Hadron Collider, where there are also, or there is a lot of interesting computational problems involved. Uh, roughly, he's author of, let's say, more than 150 publications with, let's say, on the order of 10,000 citations. Together with this, he has been very active in science popularization, so he has written books like Quantica, a recent book in Ariel, and he was also behind, or, or the organizer, or I don't know, the producer, I guess, of the documentary that was actually exhibited here on the life of uh, Professor Roy Glover, who was one of or the last member of the theory group at the Manhattan Project, so he has been really active on this. So it's a great pleasure and honor to have Jose Ignacio, um, please. So thank you, Bruno, and thank you to my institute, to the ICC at UB. So the idea is <coughs> to, in, in very plain language, to tell you a little bit about what's going on in, in quantum technologies nowadays. Uh, I'm using a word like quantum disruption, which is often used by other, my colleagues, in their presentations. So something is going on there that uh, quantum mechanics has reached a level of maturity that is enable a new generation of uh, technologies. So let me tell you little by little how it works. So first of all, I would like to draw your attention that now quantum mechanics is often in the news. Uh, very many people call that a hype, a quantum hype. Okay, maybe we should be <coughs> really careful on what people say to the journalists because we may uh, be going too far in our expectations. But anyway, let me show you a few of the news that appear in the recent years. One of them is what actually triggered the hype was that uh, Google announced, look at the date, this is December 2015. Uh, so Google said, we have tested a quantum computer and that quantum computer uh, is 10 to the eight times faster than a classical computer on a given task. Okay. When you read in detail, the task was tailored for the quantum computer to work better than the classical one. So it's not really that you have a general purpose quantum computer that outperforms the classical <coughs> computer. Anyway, that, you know, if Google says something, 
watch out, okay? So look at the next. This is still December 2015, before Hillary Clinton didn't uh, made it to, to be the president of the United States. She says explicitly that the quantum threat to the national security <laughs> demands a Manhattan-like project. This is in a democratic meeting, uh, a meeting for Democrats. And uh, well, uh, it's remarkable that a candidate to president of the United States knows about quantum mechanics, OK? Doesn't happen everywhere. Now, look at uh, another piece of news in April 2016. So a big surprise for everybody took place, which is that the European Union uh, launched a program uh, on quantum technologies, which is a flagship. So let me remind you that, well, the European Union has a complex uh, structure of financing science, and there is a thing called flagship. That uh, there were two examples: one on the on graphene and another on the brain, and there is even a competition from uh, calls for those things. But suddenly, in uh, April, the European Union decided to, to have one on quantum technologies with no calls. So it bypassed all the standard bureaucracy that they have, and they launched in May. So in April they announced, in May it is there. And they said we will spend 1 billion euros, that again uh, should be understood carefully, it's not 1 billion from the European Union, the funds must be matched by the country, by the different countries, but still 1 billion for 10 years, so that Europe is not missing the, the race which is taking over between the United States and China. Let me give you another piece of news, which is China. China is out of proportion, as you know. Everything you think about, whatever, you go to China, you have to add the number of zeros. So China has by now connected 48 cities by what is called quantum cryptography. Uh, China has launched a satellite that in 2017 produce what we call an entangled pair, an EPR pair, <coughs> an einstein podolsky rosen pair, from the satellite to two places on Earth, one in Tibet and the other in Austria. And that the guy in, in charge of these things, which is a guy called Pan, has as much money as the European Union. And actually, now they have uh, declared that they are investing 10 billion in a city. They want to have a quantum city. What can I say? Uh, it is true that China is getting better and better. Okay, it's a fact. Okay, so we, we should be aware of that. And finally, I just took one of the very many, but I took a, a piece of news that uh, uh, companies are entering. So there were news by Airbus. There are, there are companies. Uh, which are all related to the American uh, corporate, cooperative ecosystem. Okay, so all these are investing money in these things. And, well, to mention one from Europe, okay, uh, Volkswagen announced that they are using a D-Wave machine, which is a quantum computer, to try the first problems uh, that might be interested for their business. And they, they made a publication on how to assess an optimization of traffic flow in the city of Beijing. Okay. And as you can check, it's August 2017, and there are more papers uh, on this line. So many people have claimed that this idea that now we have quantum cryptography, we have quantum computation, we have quantum simulation. We can simulate now with cold gases materials. Okay, that is the reality. And that we have quantum sensors. So it turns out that now we can use nanodiamonds <coughs> to put a protein on top and read with a single atom, we read the structure of the protein. Or that we have the best measures of gravity, okay, using cold gases. So that there is a new generation where we actually control matter at the level of one atom and one photon is like 
a breakthrough in technologies. So many people call that uh, second revolution. It's a revolution where quantum mechanics becomes engineering, pure engineering. You may argue that this already happened before because we had lasers and transistors and that revolutionized our society. You may now think that we are witnessing a step beyond that because the control is much finer, more subtle. Okay, so we can do things that we couldn't do. We can codify the information in one photon. Okay, so it is subject to all the laws of quantum mechanics for the good and for the bad. And this is to be explored. Okay, so this is the flagship. It has all these structure, communication, cryptography, quantum cryptography, also what is called post-quantum cryptography. I will let you know a little bit. Computation, quantum computation, simulation. There's a big amount of things going into that. And uh, sensing, metrology. And there are transversal fields which are related to theory, understanding, basic science, software, algorithms, which are connecting all the branches. Now, <clears throat> let me try to go back to physics and, and tell you why these things are happening at the, from quantum mechanics. So there are two, a reflection that goes in two directions. So the first is that when we want to compute with quantum mechanics, which is what I will try to talk about today, uh, you have like, in the basics, it is telling you already that if you work in quantum mechanics, please think of information. Let me make it clear. I mean, in the postulates of von Neumann and the interpretation, in the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, when you go there, I mean, what you really say is that the cat, the wave function of the system, keeps all the available information of the system. Okay? Information. There is no reality to the wave function. Okay? It's the information keeping device that you're using, Keep a bookkeeping of the information. That's a mathematical construction that keeps information. So all the evolution of the wave function is evolution of the information on the system. Actually, when I want to read, okay, I get the prediction. So I have the postulates. You keep the information. You know how to relate to your observables, a postulate of observables, but then the moment that you really read, that's the third postulate, you, you say that you collapse. What do you collapse? Information. Okay? Information. And evolution must be, you need to be, information complies with the idea that the probabilities must add to one at any time. So for Neumann and the school of Copenhagen, it's a school about understanding the language of mathematics we use as a language of the information available. Okay? So man, humans, cannot know the absolute reality. They can only ask nature and receive some information from the measurement. That's it. So there is no uh, possibility of describing the absolute truth below. It's a very humble theory, quantum mechanics. It limits the way we relate to nature. Okay? We, do not, we are not gods. We don't know everything. In the words of Einstein, okay, if I don't look to the moon, how is it there or not? Okay, he comply he was against that, but let me remind you that if instead of the moon you do it with particles, we have uh, experiments that says that you, it is not possible to assign an element of uh, reality uh, to local objects, okay? That has been discarded by experiment. So if you think of quantum mechanics, please think of information and vice versa. If you think of information, think of quantum mechanics. Well, actually, the first people to make solid steps forward when they were discussing information were in the 30s, 1930s. This is Church, Post, Turing, later Gödel, all these people. And there is a basic statement which is profound truth. Computing is physics. That the formalization goes into the Turing machine. So if you want to compute, you have to construct a device that will move with a band, with a pointer, with a reading device and writing device. So f computing is physics. That's why to compute we need energy. That's why we spend energy. That's why you, you, we generate heat. Because the act of computation is an act of 
of physics. And this was understood and written in the 30s. Now, this is good, but physics is not classical physics. We know that we have an underlying construction, which is quantum mechanics. So why don't we use quantum mechanics to compute? Why don't we make this step forward and we bypass classical physics and we simply work at the level of quantum mechanics? And the first person to propose that in the 80s was Feynman, Richard Feynman. He said, he made the trivial observation, every time you want to make a simulation of quantum physics, it's a mess. Classical computers are very bad to handle the Hilbert space, which is exponentially large. If I have n qubits, I have 2 to the n coefficients, so it's a mess. So he said, the best device to simulate quantum physics is a quantum physics it itself. So why don't we think the other way around? Because we do have an example where it's inefficient to use a classical description of a system. Why don't we think everything around and we think whether quantum mechanics is good to describe classical physics? And this is the beginning of the first uh, ideas that's in the 80s and the first very serious uh, concepts come in the late 80s and early 90s. <coughs> okay, so famous algorithm I will present to you by Shore in 91 trigger this explosion of uh, interest from the rest of humanity besides quantum physics. Okay? So you have this double thing. If you think in physics, think of information. If you think of information, think of physics. <coughs> so let's do it. So let's take any system that displays a two-level structure. So you may think of uh, an atom where I can think of a, uh, an electron which is in a, let's say, ground state or excited state. Okay. If it is on the ground state, I will think of it as a logical zero. I write a ket, because it's not a logical classical zero, it's a ket, okay? with all the consequences of being a ket. I will, it, will follow, it will follow the laws of quantum mechanics. If I have the other state, I call it a 1. But this could be any system. It could be, let's say, uh, an electron, whether it's excited or not, but it could be a spin, spin up, spin down. It could be a photon, polarization up, a horizontal, vertical. Any quantum system that displays a Hilbert space of C2 okay, can be thought as a logical 0 and a logical 1. Okay? Then, we might implement them. So these are three actual implementations. I give you three out of the very many dozens. Uh, this is a tabletop experiment in quantum optics where you handle photons and you have a quantum number that you handle for single photons, okay, single photons, single detection of photons. You, we, have, we have detectors that detect one photon, okay, path, and you read a quantum number. So this experiment or this system is used to codify information for transmission, for communication. So this is the basis of photons with their polarization, is the basis for quantum cryptography. There is a second possibility, and this is really amazing, which are called time beams. I could do the following. I could send a photon, I could have a 50% uh, splitter in one it was. And this is used actually by your company, Ide Quantique, to generate communication between two uh, nodes. Okay, it's one of the technologies which is nowadays used. Superposition in arrival time. And as you know, you can build bell inequalities, everything on that. It's a remarkable fact. Okay. Now I gave another one, which are trap ions. And I play with the energies of this guy. These are different kind of traps, pole traps. All these traps, you contain these guys with electromagnetic fields on a trap and you act on them with external lasers. Okay? And because these, electrons are, uh, these atoms are in traps, these ions are in traps, their levels sense the, the trap potential. So actually when I act on one, I'm acting on all of them. Because I can enter 
and use shifts in the energies to excite the guy at the same time that the whole trap enters in the different state. Or superconducting currents. So again, using just some junctions and then superconducting uh, circuits, we can generate currents which are uh, on a superposition of uh, rotating left or rotating life, uh, right. And this is the basis for most of the current progress in quantum computers. So here it is. Now, if we take that for serious and we have a logical zero and a logical one, and on top we have quantum mechanics, and quantum mechanics has the idea that states belong to the Hilbert space, and therefore any superposition of states is also a physical state, that's a postulate, which in the old times was called superposition principle, but it, it is inherited from the structure of Hilbert spaces, it is correct to think that we have something very new. We have the possibility of having a superposition of zero and one from the logical point of view. And this is completely alien to classical computation. We have a new thing. We have qubits. We have quantum bits. So we have to learn everything. The laws that they follow, what can be done with them, are there theorems that allow for something? Can they perform some task in an amazing new way? This, of course, the basic principle is that we do control individual qubits. So we need technology. If anybody is asking why we didn't have quantum computation in the 50s, because we didn't have the control of these individual guys. Okay? It's the progress of technology that is enabling now yet another jump. Okay? <coughs> so we could do things now. They are qubits, they are physical systems, so they follow laws. So why don't we watch carefully the laws they follow and see what the logical counterpart is there. So actually if you apply certain magnetic fields to this spin, well, this spin will rotate. So actually you may go from a zero to a superposition. Okay? These pulses of a laser on these ion traps, you could generate the superposition state. And that's what now, if you do on the zero, you get the zero plus one. Therefore, on the one should be the orthogonal state because this is a unitary evolution. So it's zero minus one. And uh, you know, this is completely new. There is nothing like that in classical computation. You cannot have from a zero, half a zero, half a one. You cannot have a sign, a minus sign. How? What is that classically? Now, these signs are essential because now I will have something completely new, which is I will carry computations, I will collect signs, and eventually the coefficients will subtract. So I will get zeros. So I will have a way not to explore, explore a piece of the Hilbert space. I will have something completely new from the point of view of computation, thanks to the fact that we do have interference in quantum mechanics. This is called H because of the name of Hadamard gate. It's the Hadamard gate. That's something that if you build a quantum computer, you have to show me that you make a Hadamard gate with a given f fidelity. You have to tell me I have a fidelity of 99.3%, for instance. I can have interaction between the spins and I can tune them to produce whatever thing. Okay, I can play now with single gates plus some interaction and uh, uh, an interaction of choice for many people is to define what is called a control knot, C knot gate, okay, OXOR, depending on your background. <laughs> so this is a gate, so that's an interaction that for all practical purposes manipulates information in a given way. So if the first qubit is zero, the second doesn't change. So zero zero goes to zero zero and zero one goes to zero one. If the first is zero, nothing changes. If the, second, if the first is a one, it changes the other. So zero becomes a one, and one becomes a zero. That's a control knot. So it's possible to check that with a control knot as a single interaction and arbitrary single qubit gates, you have a paradigm for computation. You can do every unitary evolution on a system of n qubits. Therefore, you have the basics for computation. Okay? So it's up to you if you're an experimentalist to go to the lab and manage the C0 and single qubit gauges, gates. So you may know that there <coughs> have been enormous competition to produce these things. And let me uh, pay uh, my tribute to Ignacio Thirac, okay, who was the first 
person to suggest that in an ion trap, if by using these lasers that are off resonance, you could excite the, the whole system and then acting a second time, I would go to another place in such a way that the control knot was created. So the first proposal ever for explicit control knot, that is Thirak Tholler, okay? And then later Rainer Blatt produced the actual implementation of that on an ion trap and they deserve the credit for being the, the first real step for quantum computation. Uh, it triggered the interest of these things. <coughs> now, I argue now that this is great because if I can be manipulate quantum mechanics at that level, I have two amazing advantages. The first advantage is that if I take n qubits on a state, if I have 10 ions there, the amount of information they carry is 2 to the n complex numbers. <coughs> That's a fact. I have 2 to the n coefficients. So this is a massive superposition. That's an exponential superposition. That means that I can codify things there. I could codify all the possible solutions to a problem. Mm -hmm. And the system is unique. It's one, ten guys. And I have 2 to the 10. Let me make a number for you. 50 qubits contain 2 to the 50 coefficients, which is 130 or 24 terabytes, which is much more than the whatever memory you have in a normal computer. Okay? So 50 qubits is an example that just handling the information, it's impossible on a, on a, on a classical computer. Okay? So 50 qubits is understood by many people as the as a milestone for quantum computation. If we do control 50 qubits, we are beyond whatever can be done classically. Let me give you a second example. Any unitary evolution on the state, actually, it's a unitary on every single piece of the superposition. So I'm, if I build up a unitary uh, construction that adds up plus one to any element of the basics, and I act here, I'm adding up uh, one to every guy. So I'm doing two to the n operations, logical operations simultaneously. So I have an exponential parallel, parallel computer. Okay? I, I have the absolute parallel computer. So I only have 10 guys, I act with my lasers, and I'm performing two to the 10 operations in one go. Only one go, puff. Okay? I'm not moving anybody. So my operations are very economical. I don't spend energy. Okay? I must contain, I, I must have the system keeping coherence, which is very difficult. Now that may need low temperatures, may need very special environments, but I will need a lot of effort to keep the quantumness of the guy. But then when it is quantum, my actions don't cost energy. Let me remind you that Mare Nostrum, BSC, spends 1.5 million euros in electricity per year, one-third for cooling the machine and two-thirds for computation. Okay? They cannot go with the same technology to any further computer because it would typically they try to increase by a factor of uh, 50 to 100 every machine. It would uh, spend more energy than, than Catalonia. No? So they cannot go into present technology there. Yeah, this is great. So why don't we do it? Hey man, because quantum mechanics is quantum mechanics. So let me show you that there are disadvantages in quantum mechanics. The first, well, let's to take it very seriously. So let me make a unitary evolution of a system that multiplies. So I take a register and I take a zero and a one. This is zero times zero plus one times two. So this is representing a two. And this is representing a three. And I want to have six. Let's do it. Okay? Well, that doesn't work. Why? Because quantum mechanics is unitary. And therefore, there is no way that the inverse of that operator on 6 can distinguish between 2, 3, and 1, 6, or whatever. So there is no way that this can be implemented in that way. It would be a non-reversible operation. 2 times 3 giving 6 is not reversible. If I have 6, I don't know what is 2 and 3. It could be 1 and 6 or whatever. So the only way to proceed is to change. 
and think that now every time I will have a 2 and a 3, I will retain the 2 and I will generate the 6 on the second register. So the way to do that, and that's invertible, that's perfectly invertible. Okay? So this is the only operations that we can do is that to keep x and y and then x and any function on the second register. But then you see, if you remember your courses in quantum mechanics, that I have just entangled the state. Okay? So it's necessary, if you compute with quantum mechanics, the generation of entanglement. Okay? The system cannot be split. Well, let me show you another problem with that. Well, this is just to mention that quantum computation is reversible. Okay? You know, anytime you run a quantum computer and you end up with something, if you don't measure, which is a collapse, I could undo it. Okay? A trivial uh, way to check that the quantum computer is good or bad is to run the secret U and then U dagger and see whether you have the identity. Copy. So now I want to do another task. I have a 2 and I have a 0. I call it Ancilla, using the Latin name, okay? which is not very, very nice, by the way, but uh, it is typ typically called an Ancilla. Uh, and then I want to end up with a copy. Okay. So this is the same as when you are typing your document, you do save, make a copy somewhere. Okay, save as. Buff. Well, let's see. Is that a unitary guy? Well, indeed, it is not in general possible to do a cloning. Why? Look at the trivial demonstration. Call the Ancilla A and I do a machine that copies the 0 into the 0 and the 1 into the 1. So that's a copying machine, that's a quantum Xerox machine. What would be the action of that machine on a superposition? Well, it would, it's linear, no? It's it goes in a distributive way. So it gets 0, 0, plus 1, 1. And this is not the product of twice the first state. So as you see, there is an incompatibility between uh, the basic linear evolution of quantum mechanics and copying. It's impossible. Okay? So this is such a profound result as people have discovered in the last 20 years. You can prove that not cloning is, is it's the why we don't know what a state is. So I, I tell you, look, I would send you a quantum state. Can you tell me what, what it was, what I sent you? Uh, and I decide to send a vertical guy, a spin up. And I, the guy measuring, accidentally, he measures in the vertical direction. He says up, and he says, my if, I think it was up. I checked, oh, good, it was up, okay? But in general, there is no, no reason why they should be the same. So I could send the vertical, he measures in any direction, he projects on that direction, and he tells me it's in that direction. I said, no, man. <laughs> there was a probability. But with a single guy, there is no way you infer the original state. There is an obstruction to the knowledge of nature. Again, I could have a, a very uh, clever methodology that would be send me your state, and I copy a million times, and I measure in all possible directions, and I reconstruct the original state. Well, that would work. It doesn't work because there is no cloning theorem. So there is an obstruction to no what is a state in nature? There is no way. If you don't have any promise on the state, if you don't have any prior, quantum mechanics makes, there is a fidelity two-thirds that can be computed, which is the maximum you can get. You can check that it is behind the no violation of causality. You can check that there are protocols that would violate causality if you could clone. You can see that quantum cryptography would break because I send you I, I send you information codified on quantum states is Alice to Bob's if Eve could get that state and copy she could learn what is transmitted so again no cloning is behind this the the fact that quantum cryptography cannot be violated and finally and not the least if you do a computation how, how do you read what you wanted to read how do you deal with the fact that quantum mechanics has by postulate an inherent element of randomness? So how do you make a deterministic computation? So everything is very complicated. So we have promises which are amazing and we have drawbacks which are amazing. So making an algorithm is pure magic. Okay? That's why 
the few that trigger everything are, you know, everybody believes that they are so great. So let me give you only two examples. Uh, well, actually more. One is such a basic one, which is really surprising. So imagine that my task is the following. I'm in the outer world and there is a machine I call Oracle, the Delphos <coughs> Oracle. I go there and I ask a question. Will it drain? And then I get yes, no. I don't know how the inner workings of the Oracle work. Okay? There is an Oracle. So I will only send a question and I will get the feedback. How this is done? No idea. And I can do that with quantum mechanics. I can send X and I can receive a unitary of X. And I'm asking the following. To get some information about F, how many times should I call the oracle? How many times should I go to Delphos? Yeah, imagine I have to take a plane to Greece and ask the guy, come back. Uh, another question. I go, so it's expensive to call the oracle. Okay? It, it spends energy. So I want to minimize my calls to the oracle. So let's take the simplest example. So the simplest example is whether f, which goes, receives 0 or 1 and returns 0 or 1, whether it is constant or not, whether it's balanced. So the option is, is the answer to 0 and 1 the same or not? That's the only thing I want to know. So classically, you see, <laughs> to know that, there is little doubt that you have to ask what is f of 0 and what is f of 1. So I have to go to the oracle and ask twice. The zero and the one. Two calls to the oracle. Can I do it with less? Yes. Well, amazingly, uh, I will not try to follow the detail, but I do a Hadamark, a Hadamark, a call to the f function in a given way, which is addition, as I did before. And I can check that if I prepare the zero and one, I do the Hadamark, it goes to that, I do this operation, it carries the f's, and this can be written in a very elegant way. And if I do a final Hadamark, I see that the probability of zero, if the function is balanced, is constant, this one plus one is zero, so I, I, I have a one, and here I have a minus one, it's zero. Whereas if the function is unbalanced, I have the opposite. So uh, by reading this qubit, I get a zero for uh, constant functions and a one for non-constant functions. So how many times I call the oracle? One time. Wow. It can be checked that there are functions with two to the n calls and you do it with one time. So you can have an exponential advantage in the number of calls. So this is telling you that the laws of quantum mechanics are amazingly subtle and that bringing these together is not trivial but there are ways and this is deterministic. Okay. So even though everything is probabilistic, the final solution has zero coefficient for the wrong answer. And notice the minus sign, interference. So without quantum mechanics, there is no way to do that. Now, this is a famous one. Maybe you heard about that Grover algorithm. This is even more subtle. I, you know, in the old fashioned way, there were phone books. You would look for La Torre and there would be my phone number there. But what if you wanted to, to know what is uh, the guy who owns uh, another number in the phone book? There was no way. You should go you know, page by page looking for the guy. And finally you would read, oh, this was Perez. Okay? Well, this is search in an unstructured database. Okay? The database has no structure for you and you are looking for a guy. So can it be done? How? Well. The theorem, uh, the construction of the algorithm, I'm not presenting it for you, shows that there is a universal gain of a square root of n. So if you needed a million calls on a city of a million guys, with quantum mechanics you do it with a thousand. Mm -hmm. Square root of that. And that's considered a very generic gain of quantum logic of a classical logic. It's what we call a primitive. So this primitive is very solid, it's transversal. It goes to every problem, at least quantum mechanics is giving you a square root of n. Let me also mention that you may have seen things like quantum blockchain and things like that. Well, there are two ways where quantum mechanics affects bitcoins and blockchains. One is at the level of mining and another is at the level of uh, cryptography. 
So if a quantum computer is there, at present, all these bitcoins, except a couple of them, are using the protocols based on RSA, okay, on the traditional cryptography, or derivatives, elliptic curves, or discrete locks. So all these algorithms have the very same base. Okay? Whereas there are a couple of currencies that use another guy. And this is post-quantum, which is safe. Well, there, a quantum computer, as I will show you, would break that currency. Bitcoin in particular. And there is another place, which is the proof of... I, I'm assuming you all <laughs> know what are blockchains, but... Uh, there is another one which is called mining, and this is the certification by the mass of the computers on Earth. I want to certify your transaction. I put my power... I have to show you that I'm willing to do that. And for that, I have to make a proof of effort. And what I do is I solve a hash problem. Okay? That's what authorizes me now to, to certify your, your transaction. Indeed, Grover affects the hash. Okay? And again, it's a possibility that these hash functions uh, have to be changed. Not only because of quantum mechanics, but but because of the consumption of energy they produce on Earth. Okay, and finally, and this is the star guy. Well, look, if anything I said sounds medium, this is really beyond, uh, this is really why everything is happening, okay? And this is due to a mathematician called Shor. So think of finding the factors of PQ that multiply to N. So I give you N, you have to find P and Q. So there are theorems in mathematics that show you that problems can be transformed into each other. Okay? They can be mapped in a polynomial time. So I don't need a lot of operations. I can pass from one to the other in a, in a fast way. Indeed, it turns out that factorization is tantamount to find the period of a function. A period, a function that has a period. The period of the function of A being a random number to R, I want to see when R added a given number produces the same result, which is 1 mod n. If I do that, there is a way that automatically from the period R, prof, I produce the two factors P and Q. And all these steps are polynomial. So either you factor in your preferred way, trying all the prime numbers, dividing by them, that's a possibility. Another is finding a period. Okay? So factoring is about finding a hidden period, a hidden symmetry in a, in a function. How do I do that? Well, that's a, the drawing of the circuit. Let me show you that there are only three pieces. One is preparing all possible solutions, and then I do with the Hadamard. Because every zero goes into zero plus one. When I multiply zero plus one, zero plus one, zero plus one, I have all the possibilities. So the first step is generate all possible solutions. Second, compute this period and then do a Fourier transform to read the period. And when you do it in detail, it turns out that every step here, and I go fast, is polynomial in quantum actions. Every step. So doing that, the model exponentiation was done by three guys in the 90s, and it is easy. It is efficient. Then you generate a period, and then you read the period with the Fourier transform, which is easy. So when you end up everything, you measure probabilities and you can prove that the probabilities are not exponentially suppressed. So you have everything. You have an algorithm. Okay? You can actually simulate that on your, on your classical computer and verify that this is okay. So factorization goes from the classical computers, which is exponential. This is the field sieve algorithm, the best algorithm we have nowadays which is again a probabilistic algorithm. It's uh, exponential of n one third log n two thirds with a prefactor which is known. And in quantum mechanics is n cubed. So this idea that we go to keys that are 2,000 bits or 4,000 and every doubling is the age of the universe, on a quantum computer would be only a factor of four. Okay? So you understand you have an exponential speed up. So sooner than later, a quantum computer okay, will certainly factor. Now, we may argue whether this is how many years. Okay? We may discuss that. But uh, once this is done, 
all our internet, all our cryptography, all your social networks, uh, all your transactions with the banks can be broken. Okay? So now, this is a moment to understand why Hillary Clinton was saying we need something here. Okay, we need something. Are we ready for that? Let me show you that even the most powerful agency in the world, which is the NSA, National Security Agency in the States, says we must act now. Okay, it's not something to play with. If the Chinese guys are building these things, we are in trouble. So actually, not only it said we must act now, but it acted. So what did the NSA did? It did first a deep recommendation of all the protocols of security that maybe in a certain period of time could be broken. So they did recommend to use all these set of protocols and still consider safe the, the SHA functions uh, which are big enough. And next, and this is pretty interesting, it called the NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technologies, to open a competition for ideas to substitute classical cryptography with a new classical cryptography, which is not based on algorithms that can be broken by a quantum computer. That goes under the name of post-quantum cryptography. Post-quantum in the sense that it is quantum resistant. Okay? Now, the, the call ended in November 2017, and it's very likely they will take between two and five years to take a decision. The day the NSA makes a decision, all the public institutions in the state, including the military, must change their protocols. So that's serious stuff. Okay. Now, these quantum resistant protocols is deep mathematics. If you thought that factoring is deep mathematics because there are hidden subgroups, the candidates that people are considering are essentially factorizations in fields in drinks, actually, okay? And there, the, the drawback of all this idea is that there are no theorems. There is no theorem whatsoever that any of the proposed candidates would be saved against any quantum attack. Actually, you can make cryptography by very honest structure things, but then it's very costly in time for the classical computers. And when you bring a little <coughs> bit of structure to make it easier, you may think that quantum mechanics will use that structure. So this balance of structure, I need structure to multiply fast and factor difficult. I need structure. That's what quantum mechanics uses, the structure. The, all the candidates need to alleviate one way by giving structure. So automatically people can think of attacks going to that structure. It turns out that by now we know how to attack periodicity, but we may have other things. Okay, so the, this picture is that quantum computation is the threat and you have two umbrellas. You have the umbrella of quantum resistant cryptography or you have the umbrella of quantum cryptography, codified with quantum devices. That I'm not saying anything, okay? But you should know that at TIC4 are people that are doing these things. And from the point of view of problems, uh, in the old-fashioned way we had the P problems and the NP, so non-deterministic polynomial problems on a, quant on a Turing machine. And factorization was not known. It is not classified as an NP-complete problem. Okay? It's an, a limbo for factorization. It turns out that quantum mechanics has put factorization into the QB, so bound quantum polynomial class, which is efficient. And it is not proven but believed that the new category called quantum merlin Arthur will embrace all the NP category. So there will be problems that remain difficult even on a quantum computer. Are we, do we have quantum computers? Well, this is Google's 9 qubit, which is very good. IonQ has reached of the order of more than 10. The cloud computer, you can register and play with quantum computers nowadays. This is the 5 qubit. Now they have uh, 16 qubit on the cloud. Microsoft, no drawing, because apparently there is a failure on all the strategy of Microsoft. They wanted to use topology to codify information, and this has proven very difficult, and they are not getting anywhere so far. Or you have Rigetti. He raised $65 million from venture capital, and he has put on the, on the, on the cloud a 19-qubit <coughs> computer. The wave has gone through a different strategy, no gates, pure annealing, so cooling the system, 
So it's based on a completely different idea. You have a quantum mechanical system and you want to find the minimum by cooling. And this is D-Wave. And they have gone to 2048 qubits of very poor quality. So they are not competitive in some directions. But the traffic in Beijing was done with the D-Wave. So the recent progress, as I said, is, is this. But let me mention that quantum supremacy, the, the 50 qubits I mentioned in the beginning, is, according to the latest news of last month, it has been already printed. So the foundry produced already a 50 qubit and they are testing. They want to check whether it is possible to do that. They will do something which is called bosonic sampling to prove that at least there is a first task ever that a classical computer cannot reproduce. So there will be a complete specification of a circuit that I will handle to a classical computer and say, find the result. And it will be a very small circuit, but the 2 to the 50 makes it impossible, essentially. Okay? My, my prediction is that people will do it classically, okay? because now there are so many people trying to make classical computers better. Now, there are words that people have managed already to deal with 60. But you see, it's exponential. So, okay, it's not 50, it will be 100, whatever. 100, 2 to the 100 is more than all the memory on Earth. Okay, all the computers on Earth. Annealing is this idea of cooling, taking advantage of tunneling. So instead of fluctuations as you think of them thermal, think that quantum fluctuations would allow tunneling barriers, and you will go to the minimum in that way. Now, quantum computation should be, break, uh, should be good for many things. One is to put in jeopardy every, every piece of security on Earth. That's a, I don't know if it is good or bad. Uh, uh, but you can train large neural networks, you can think of optimization problems, the traffic flow. There is a problem that everybody is focusing, which is quantum chemistry. It turns out that quantum chemistry is a very heavy problem. There is a problem that everybody considers a landmark for quantum computation that would be to get better results than any classical computer on what is called nitrogen fixation, okay, in nitrogen assay. No, not Okay. That's a problem which is used for fertilizers and other things. Scheduling, but many problems. So many people eh, ask, the big question is, when? No? When all these things happen? Well, supremacy very likely in 2018. Now, to get a real good computer, you need error correction. You need that your qubits are working in the right way. Now, this is far away. Okay? This is not tomorrow. Even if we have 50 qubits to get decent error correction, we need to scale to 1,000. It is true that at, at Google they are already uh, working on the designs of 1,000. Okay? But as of today, we are very far. Okay? Very far. Well, if you had asked me five years ago whether we would have quantum computers of this size now, I would say no, of course. So, as you know, Niels Bohr said that predicting is very difficult, in particular the future. So this, this idea is the same. Predicting the future is very, very difficult. For me, the question is not when, but who. And uh, there is a moral uh, side to the whole thing. I mean, it would be a nation or a corporation. Would it be private or public? Would it be proprietary? Would you pay? Mm -hmm. It's the same as for the genome. I mean, is a information about humans, something that should be kept. So if you want to take the analogy of the <coughs> Manhattan Project, it was relevant that it was a nation. It conditioned the geopolitics of the 20th century. So we should maybe decide on these things. Uh, so we should really uh, press laws in some sense. Uh, what, uh, we wanted to be in the who side, okay, not on the when side. Uh, so we made this group, and let me just take advantage of telling you that this is a very humble, very modest, no way we can compete, money-like, I mean, we cannot compete. But we are having a quantum hub uh, at the BSC, and we have two sites. We are building a quantum annealer, and we are building a software service. So the, the piece of, of the experimental lab is uh, directed by Paul von Dietz. He's from here, from Baden, our university. He left uh, nine years ago, and um, he produced, he's one of the few Spaniards that has produced a qubit. 
in, uh, maybe you know in, that in Waterloo there is a big quantum valley, they call it, because Lazarides, the millionaire of the BlackBerry, invested by now 600 million, I, I don't remember how many millions of dollars to make uh, Toronto, uh, not Toronto, Ontario, uh, the center of quantum technology in Canada and hopefully in the world. So he was there and he made, this is a qubit made by Paul. So we have qubits in Barcelona now. This is a circuitry. This is how a computer looks like. So this is a, a structure which is based on the idea of cooling. So you go from room temperature on the top to the 15 millikelvins, which is the temperature you need to run this thing because the transitions to the f uh, between the two states in the zero and one are around 100 or a little bit more. So you have to be below the temperatures where you would excite uh, states. And uh, we, have build, uh, we are building a consortium with very many partners and companies. And we, our plans are annealing. Annealing need not, not, do not need error correction. We want to have what is called coherent quantum annealer. So we want to keep coherent. And hopefully, we will have three, 10 qubits control in th three years. And we, we are hinting at 100. That would be quantum supremacy by far in six years. And on the theory side, let me mention that Artur Garcia Saez, who also came by here, and Alba uh, are working on the theory. And now we are concentrating on an idea. We are concentrating on testing quantum computers in a remote way. So what are the tests that one computer should pass? We are running that on the IBM and on the Rigetti machines. And we are working on this idea that I think is dominating now uh, uh, all the efforts, which is look at what a clever idea, not ours. It's done by, by some people and everybody is collaborating. Take a quantum computer, but let me tell you where to put the gates. So give me the freedom of classically call you by phone and say one and two should talk, two and five should uh, have these other interactions. So let me characterize the secret on the phone for you. I have a classical characterization. That circuit will produce a state belonging to the Hilbert space. And think of that as covering an amazing amount of possibilities. And check if the solution is good or not. OK? You could think of a Hamiltonian and check whether it's a, the ground state, whether the energy is a minimum or not. I read something, but now I have this enormous amount of parameters and I know that they are providing me with the possibility of checking something which classically it's impossible to check, which is a hundred qubit, state of a hundred qubit, but I measure. Now I've read this energy, and now I use machine learning, I use gradient methods, I use whatever, okay, uh, covariance matrices for the gradients, uh, every of the technologies that have been developed in machine learning recently to feed back everything and modify my quantum machine. And little by little, I approach a solution. This is a scheme that allows for uh, encoding essentially every optimization problem and taking the advantage of exploring an exponential space. Okay, so this is really an algorithm that works, that seems to, to be behind the possible solutions to many of the things. So let me conclude. Well, my my first comment is that quantum computing is in a way an implementation of quantum engineering. There are no new formulas, no new laws of physics are discovered, okay? Still is a control of basic physics, okay? Yes. We are jumping in quality how we control nature, okay? Second is that quantum computation has three advantages. It may have speed advantage in some problems. It will have definitely size <coughs> advantage, the size you can handle, and definitely energy. You know, all these 50 qubits, you have to spend the energy to get to 50 millikelvin, but then it runs without energy, okay? So to compare whether you can match the computation of, fifth of these 50 qubits, the super, the Mare Nostrum will spend a lot of energy, a lot of energy. And then that the new research strategies are at work. So we are collaborating at BSC. This is a natural place to have computation at the highest level. Supercomputing centers, and they understand that. Julich in Germany is also having a quantum team and so on. Uh, and definitely also new figures of merit. So our publications in uh, 
internals, the figure of merit that you're doing well. Well, Brigetti has not published anything for years. They don't care. They think this is irrelevant. Okay? What they want is to go ahead. So it's a change of paradigm of how we understand certain things. So this is essentially due to the fact that you are talking about quantum engineering, not about the discovery. No? Uh, yet it's fundamental whether a new algorithm is published or not because that makes it public or, or proprietary. So it's a big debate now among the community to what extent one should publish. And uh, may I remind you that in the Manhattan Project, in 41, it was forbidden to publish about fission hmm, by law. Because the state, there are no publications in 40, uh, after 41. Now the quantum brace is for quantum supremacy, for factorization, for cryptography. Let me say that there is a lot of people working on that and on sensors. I, I didn't enter in the explanations of sensors, but uh, it's really a beautiful uh, area of research. And I think I'm, I'm done. Thank you very much. Oh, this came out wrong. Thank you very much. So, okay, thank you very much. Just a brief comment, as usually with the colloquium, there is a meeting for students and postdocs who want to talk to him in more detail at 3.30 in the Aula Pera Pascual, which is in the fifth floor of physics. So now I think we have time for some questions. Not too many, but... If any. Tomeo, please. Tomeo, please. So, uh, about quantum error correction, you were given this quantum computer with 50 qubits. How sure are you about the result you get? And you were saying that you need to go to 1,000 qubits to For be... error correction, yeah. And that is a very optimistic number compared to other figures I heard of. You need For every qubit, you need 40 or... Depends even. on the quality you want. Okay. So, okay. Uh, let me say this 50 will not have error correction, okay? And that's why the secret must have a low depth. So not very many operations. So if you keep the number of qubits fixed, but you keep doing things, it's more and more difficult for a classical computer to simulate. So a low depth is easier to simulate, a long depth it's impossible. So they are going to the depth that makes it impossible for the classical, but error correction is not dramatic, okay? Because uh, it's short enough to have something. And there is a figure of merit they have to show that the final output is generated by a quantum thing. So the sample is compatible only with quantumness. And this is related to the minor signs. Okay, so it turns out this is when you show light. Martinez likes to say that you, you, you threw a grid. If, the, if you have a laser, you produce a grid because the, the source was quantum. If you send white light, you see a, a white spot. So this pixeling that you see in the final result is a proof that you had coherence because you have negative signs and cancellations in some points. So what they are doing is this boson sampling that if it were generated by a classical machine, it would have a more uniform distribution. If it is a quantum machine, it is picked at points. Okay? So where it is picked is something that the classical computer cannot reproduce. Notice that this problem is useless. So they have not found anything with 50 qubits with a structure that the classical algorithm uh, is worse than this machine. So they are, of course, they are doing their job. Okay, they are, they are trying to convince you that they have something powerful, yet there is not a single example of something powerful at 50 qubits. It's claimed that at 300 qubits, you have, everything is, is already, would be for the quantum computer. So we are leaving the, what is called the noisy stages of quantum computation. This is the name that John Preskill has invented. So this is. I think uh, the criticism, uh, I've been criticizing myself many of the things they do, and, uh, but we should be aware, really in the heart of a scientist, that this is for good, no? okay, that we can criticize, but this is for good. I mean, humans are getting to the level where we control matter at the point of making possible this quantum computation with laws that were impossible till now. Okay, just like laser in the past provided us with the new technology. So this is the point. And, 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 and computation is basic. We live on a society which is based on computation, as you know. We live on the horse of computers. Our phones are computers. I mean, 
if you think when they tell you where you are, how many computations have gone around. It's really amazing. So one should be critical, yet accept that these people are doing an amazing job. Okay. Any further questions? Or maybe... Yes, uh, what I'm wondering is that by building these quantum computers, uh, whether we may also be doing a fundamental test on whether nature works indeed by quantum mechanics. You are, you are correct. I, uh, <laughs> but, uh, you are absolutely correct. Let me just mention that in all these technologies, uh, one of them is clocks, as you know. And now we have clocks roughly of one part in 10 to the 20. One of the things that Wineland, the Nobel Prize, did was checking the tidal effects on, on, on the clock by raising. Now I think they are at the level of one millimeter. You raise one millimeter, you detect the change of pace of time okay, because of general relativity. But one of the things they did is to verify how alpha QED changes with time. So the best measurement for short distances are coming from these uh, kind of experiments. So it's by, by checking with such a wonderful accuracy, these things. Okay. Okay. The low temperatures for the cesium and so on, then you get much better control and you go down, in, uh, you're much finer. And you are testing alpha QED. Okay, okay. So, uh, I wanted to ask something else, uh, which is that uh, whether quantum mechanics is the fundamental true okay. theory of the world or not. Okay, and so let's imagine, let, let me ask you just a question. Let's imagine that we built a quantum computer with enough qubits that you can say uh, no classical computer could reproduce this computation, even if it had all the matter of the universe and the age of the universe yeah. to perform this computation. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. Do you think the answer of this computer would follow the prediction of quantum mechanics or then would follow some other rules that we don't understand? We, we will never know, no? because you cannot solve it uh, analytically and you don't have this classical simulation. <laughs> so at that point, you are in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, factoring, yeah. yeah. So <coughs> how did nature do the calculation? That's my question. Oh, but that's when we follow at least the, the algorithm that we know. If quantum mechanics is correct. Yeah. So the question is if it doesn't factor, is quantum mechanics wrong or our well, machine is wrong? <laughs> no? But let me say, okay, let me say something. The Bell inequality for two particles, you know this, less than two. Uh, so A, well, the basic CHSH inequality, if, if you have quantum mechanics, you evaluate with more than two, up to two square root of two, this is called the Tyrosol bound. So the maximum violation of the Bell inequality dictated by quantum mechanics is two square root of two. Now if you think, if it nature were not quantum mechanics, okay, give me a hint, what would you like to have in nature? You say causality. I do not want any theory that violates causality. I go to the Bell inequality and I see that the bound of causality is 4. So quantum mechanics is 2 square root of 2, classical physics 2, and causality is 4. Could there be something in between? Yes. Why not? So have we done that? Yes. Have people checked whether when you keep doing this experiment you have slight deviations beyond 2 square root of 2? They have checked. Now the best measure in, of 2 square root of 2 is with five decimal places. So the experiments are telling us that quantum mechanics is the real thing. And we are testing beyond quantum mechanics. Okay? The Bell case, non-locality could be larger without violation of, Bell, of, uh, of causality. Causality is related to the marginals. And the marginals are neutral, but two square root of two is quantum mechanics. So apparently nature wants, likes quantum mechanics. We don't have any evidence, and it has been tested <coughs> extensively, and everything is working according to. I did. So you are you are currently working at BSC because you found a better ecosystem to work there. So <laughs> what would it take to bring part of the activity back to the university? No, I, I no, no. I love. Look, I, I keep. Uh, we keep uh, working here. Of course, I'm. You be all my life, no? no but I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, but the computer. Uh, it is yeah. a fact. I mean, I, I'm discovering something to the older people that the university has a bureaucracy and a method of working which is very difficult, and the institutes are different. ICFO is, has grown in a different way, and uh, everything works different. BSC works different, and uh, 
they are much faster. In that. This is a fact. Okay? Why we don't change our university is another thing, okay? which is a system very difficult to change. Okay? But let me mention, because you are asking me this question, that one of the main things about the project in experimental science is all the, the instrumentation. Okay? This is very necessary. So we need uh, understandings of low temperatures, we need f fast electronics, we need uh, slow uh, electronics, we need uh, design. And, uh, and as you know, but I want to make it public, we are trying to build collaborations with every person around that, that is interested in any of these pieces of I think profoundly <laughs> with age I've become aware <laughs> that the real physics is experimental in a way <laughs> and my respect <laughs> is infinite for that and I think that uh, what we need to build up uh, is with extremely good high level technology uh, to be able to participate in the high level experiments that are being done. Okay. So I, I obviously I want to collaborate with this, and let me say with Autonoma and with everybody. Uh, I this is the only effort to make a computer in all the south of <coughs> Europe. Okay, there is no other anywhere. Uh, maybe we can have one more question as it is a little bit late. Hombre, a student finally. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a silly question regarding the, the way you define a quantum computer. So I understand a quantum simulator is kind of quantum computer that performs a specific task. Mm -hmm. And if you have, my question is, if you have a digital quantum simulator, there is a universal, there is a quantum computer. And if that's so, a quantum annealer is then a quantum computer, is a quantum simulator, what? Okay, I mean, so the, the precise answer is the following. So when everything started, there were several ways of producing computations. So one of them was gates. The other was this minimization. And supplemented with a thing called adiabatic evolution that you could check that everything worked. And there was another one, which is called one-way computer. There were three paradigms. So what was proven in the early thousands, you know, at the turn of the millennium, is that uh, uh, they are equivalent up to polynomial effort. Therefore, if you have any of them, you can do the others. So it's very clear in one sense, if you have a, an annealer that you are minimizing a given function, you can trotterize, which is called, you can separate in exponentials, and those are gates. It turns out that you can put together the gates into one potential, at the cost that this uh, annealer must have certain flexibility in all the possible interactions. So there is a mapping between the two, and it is theoretically proven. So you should call it a quantum computer too, an annealer. Okay? Simply it's based on a different philosophy. Okay? But you can adapt into that philosophy anything. There is a trick which is, goes back to Feynman, how to put evolution in time into a Hamiltonian. That's a very beautiful idea of Feynman. Yeah. Uh, Done? Yes, I think there are no super urgent questions. Let's <laughs> thank the speaker again. Thank, uh, thank you, you everybody. <laughs>